So, are you excited for this? I'm very excited about this. Audience, I hope you're excited about this because this is basically something that's 30 years in the making. I, 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 I have not seen this episode. First of all, I have not watched the show in 15 years, maybe. Yeah, it only really, they only really did re, uh, uh, we call it, they only really did reruns on Lifetime. That's really like the only network that ever did reruns of this. It was, it's basically like considered a, a lost classic because a lot of people forgot about it, except for like Southern Queens. Um, right. and, uh, and so, because it didn't get it didn't get the rerun kind of life that a lot of the other shows got. I mean, it was literally a contemporary of like Golden Girls and those shows, and they were at the time it was just as popular as those shows. It and if you want to watch Designing Women with us, yes, I'm watching. I'm watching on Hulu. Hulu. Uh, that that is the only place I've seen to legally stream it. Unless you want to buy the DVD collectors items at Amazon. I mean, and if either one, if somebody out there in the world wants to gift those to us, <laughs> we will not say no. No, I'm sure. I mean, I, mean, I, I doubt it costs more than $30, probably. <laughs> so, I'm going to take this intro. You could do next week's. Cool. This is episode one. Wait, hold on. Before we do oh, episode oh, one. Oh, oh, God, 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 oh, God. Yeah. Before we do episode one, we should give like a little background on the show, right? Like, oh, I guess about... I guess you're right. Go before ahead. Before we dive, start. before we dive right into the show, we should at least like give some background. So, um, <laughs> all right. So, dear listeners, um, so dear for listeners, dear listener, er, um, so this, design... this one, will, this one will probably get up to twelve at least. Yeah, exactly. I I I think that this is a, a gonna be fun, right? This is like literally a show that's near and dear to our hearts as it's two, true. two Southern gay boys. Um, now, uh, for people that aren't familiar with Designing Women, so Designing Women was a show that ran on CBS uh, right. for uh, seven seasons. Seven seasons, 163 yep. episodes, I believe. Yep, it was uh, between September 29th, 1986 and May 24th, 1993. So technically, this show really encapsulates our childhood to teenage uh, years because it's that's true. that's literally like when we started school um the producers of the show uh harry thompson and linda bloodworth thompson were very very popular sitcom writers and producers at the time um and and this itself was a little bit of a controversial one for them uh yeah. because of the nature of the times remember it was 86 so we're still talking about the reagan years it was still a very conservative america and and these two uh, Clintonites, for lack of a better term, um, they they supported Clinton. They probably helped him get to office. For yeah, they were big. Uh, yeah. They were they were large. Uh, they had a large liberal presence. You know, like I said, this is at a time when liberal wasn't really a thing in Hollywood because they were everybody kind of kept under the radar, so to speak, right. um, because of the the conservative uh, kind of takeover of the country for a little bit. Um, but yeah, but this is like, this was kind of their little bit of a, uh, I guess you'd call it a, a reactionary TV show to yep. where they felt the country was going. So much like, uh, some of their other shows at the time, you know, Night Court was, uh, talking about kind of basically in a funny way, criminal justice, um, Golden Girls was talking about ageism and, and things like that. So, uh, Designing Women kind of put their foot in the field as speaking about, feminist uh issues mm -hmm. correct and murphy brown was in there doing the same thing um That's right. it, it ended up they, they started um they were nearly canceled after the first season mm -hmm. um and th due to uh viewer backlash they were forced to put it back on monday night they wrote cbs rotated them around to multiple different time slots trying to find the right one um which which always kills um they received a lot of uh viewer Hate backlash mail. um and they put it on just before Murphy Brown. Yep. Um, and which which led to a very feminist <laughs> hour long block. Of, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can't think of a better way to put that, but it was a huge feminist hour long block. I mean, when you when you put it into context, there really technically hasn't been a block of comedies since like that because these two shows were unashamedly feminist and feminine feminine empowering. Right. Um, I mean, in this show, you have a single woman, mm -hmm. a divorced woman, a 
well, a, a recently divorced woman, a woman who has been divorced <laughs> multiple times for money, basically. And um, a, a woman, a widower. Yeah. And it's, it's Emmy Shaq Taylor. Yeah, um, Shaq. <laughs> who, who is absent for the first episode, which I didn't even realize. Yep. Um, but I do, w- w- we may address this a little bit more later on. Why didn't he just play a gay man? Like, <laughs> we're gonna we'll, get. We'll, we'll, we'll dive get into, into that. Shaq Taylor. We'll dive into that that pool later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is a that is a deep pool of a lot of things that we're gonna get into. Yeah, so, episode one, designing women. That's literally the episode title. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the pilot. looks like a pilot too oh it it really does it really does um so the first thing we 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 go in right like we we go into the house we see the house first of all even before that when georgia on my mind started playing which everyone out there i just want to tell a little beef that i have with the ray charles family (laughs) i I was talking to auntie babe noir before this started so Georgia on my mind was made the um, Georgia State song, um, and should technically be in public domain as it is the state song, and is performed basically as their anthem. However, <laughs> Ray Charles is cho- and, and it's specifically the arrangement by Ray Charles. However, the Charles family, the children after his death decided to litigate anybody who uses that song that's not affiliated with the same Georgia. So we will not be using that song for our no. theme song. <laughs> no, no, we can't. Uh... Hey, I did find out a cool thing though. Cause I was actually, um, when we were talking about the theme song, I actually thought about that too. And I was like, Oh, cause I remembered that he didn't, he didn't do it in the beginning. Right. So I was like, Oh, I was like, cause you know, he didn't even, it wasn't even like a part of the show right. that, it, that it was him. Do you know who did the theme song at the beginning? Who? Doc Severinsen from The Tonight Show. Fantastic. Right? I was like, what a great, like, talk about, like, still some more, like, TV nostalgia and, like, Mm -hmm. that kind of connection. I was like, that's even, that, for me, made, like, made the show even better. Just to think of, like, him and his, like, little fancy outfits that he was always wearing on The Tonight Show conducting his little orchestra Uh during the theme song. I was like, that's so cool. So, so, so we, we, we first the theme song gives you chills. You go through pictures of all of them, uh, ending with me, Shaq Taylor, who's not in the episode. Um, <laughs> like, I'm so glad that they put him in the credits for the plot because well, he ain't even been thought about yet. Well, the cool part was though is that like, I mean, based on the opening, uh-huh. you can, you, clearly they thought the show is definitely getting picked up because. Yeah. They already had an opening with a character that's not even in the first episode, which is the pilot. So they're like, "No, it's gonna get picked up. We'll we'll put him in there." So so we come in and there's Gene Smart, comic mm. genius, mm. Uh, playing Charlene, and dramatic genius, at and this dramatic point. genius, um, in front of the largest chair I think I've ever seen. <laughs> they 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 went to Wicker and Rattan Warehouse and put her in this. This chair does not stay beyond the pilot, but it no. is. I mean, just... if if audience, if you're not going to watch the episode, we'll give you a better a better description of this. So, if you are a person in their late 30s, early 40s, 50s, um, the old school wicker chairs that uh-huh. people used to use for their photos uh-huh. back in the day, back in the 80s, they literally have one of those as Charlene's desk chair. Yeah, uh, which makes literally no sense at all. But girl. This is not even that kind of chair. This is that on double steroids. Like she is sitting, she sits down in this thing and it comes up behind her and over her head. Like it is, and she is a tall woman. Like she she's is. about six feet tall. 
It is insane. In toe peels, always in toe peels. <laughs> but it, it does. But the thing is, right? Like it kind of does make sense, right? Because as the as the episode first gets started, yep. right? They like without saying it at first, you get an understanding from the set that this is very slapdash company. Like it's yeah. like they're basically the the entire house. It's full of things that you're like at first you're not making not making any sense, and you're like, oh wait, they actually don't even have storage space. Right. For the for the elements, so the the, I mean, obviously they changed it as the show uh, built huh. on. But that first episode, that was part of the whole ambiance. Is like, oh, this place is like still getting off the ground, yep. and you know, of course they're using the the actual like setting chairs for the you know, this is going to get sold to a person in a couple of days, and then <laughs> Charlene's on the phone. Gene Smart plays Charlene, and then you walk through the door. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Mary Jo Shively going absolutely bonkers, just wandering in, played by Annie Potts. <laughs> Dang it, you weren't supposed to tell the audience yet that I'm Annie Potts in disguise. <laughs> just comes flailing in, flabbergasted by this house she saw that she was getting ready to do the interior design for. Like... <laughs> Well, no, remember, they were, it was in the middle of a bidding war, right? So, also, yeah. like, I think you know, I actually jotted down my favorite joke about that little scene, right? Because there's always jokes throughout the whole episode. Uh-huh. But I love that they said uh, that they're so rich, the dog's name is Richard, but they call him Dick. And then she said, they must have liked me because they said I could call him Dick. I was like, <laughs> what? What? Oh, God. Uh, oh, yeah. And then, like, I you get you get like a minute and a half of her just describing this house, and then she said that they have lions in this house, mm-hmm. lions roaring, you know, not like those ceramic jockeys, but real lions. Girl, I have an honest question: Was she talking about a lawn jockey? You know, she was. <laughs> It's society in it's society in metropolitan Georgia. Of course she was. Of course she was. That's but here's funny part, right? Because that's actually the first little hint, right? In the uh-huh. show, that little joke is the first hint at to like where this show is going to go, right? Yep. Because there are multiple jokes within the first episode that basically say we're going to talk about sexism, we're going to talk about racism, we're yep, going to talk about, true. like, all throughout the first episode, that it was like, oh, you know, we're two young men, right? We're uh-huh. six. But it was like, watching it now, I was like, oh my gosh, all of the writing was right there. So then I enter. <laughs> Miss Julia Sugarbaker. Julia Sugarbaker. Played by Dixie Carter. Woo! Comes in and just slams her head on her desk. <laughs> oh man she's so she's such a uh, i love that woman so very much so i learned something interesting okay so she she throughout you'll find out throughout this year or throughout these these years i should do this um is 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 a stalwart of liberal principles yes. right she was a republican in real life a Republican who who she was a Reagan Republican, um, but in later for every liberal rant she had, and I I want to see I want to watch it to see if it's true. For every liberal rant she had, the producers made sure she was able to sing a song. So it should later on bounce out for every liberal rant song. Whoa! <laughs> so it was like a trade off. Yeah. Whoa. That is really interesting. Yeah, I don't know if it's true or not, but that is that is the rumor of the of the of the time. Well, I mean, you remember though, like especially in the South, there were a lot of Reagan Republicans. Yep. But but that's what we would now call fiscal Republicans. Yep. And it wasn't until the whole crossover where conservative like social conservatives started taking yep. over that you did have people like that, that eventually they did vote for people like Clinton because they did have, like, black family relatives or gay family relatives and all, and, like, they didn't like that those groups were being attacked. So 
that makes a lot of sense. I actually think that if I'm not mistaken, I want to say that my dad voted for Reagan the second time around uh, because of like his whole, you know, not liking taxes. And, you know, that yeah. was still, that was still a thing that was valid back then. <laughs> yeah. Well, Julia comes in and she introduces us to the main issue throughout like all seven years that the poor sugar bakers will always have money money the show they, they are always on the cusp of closing they're always yes. on the cusp yes. of losing money and it was really crazy because now something did happen in this episode that i had to look it up because i was i didn't realize this right but julia said something in the first episode to charlene and i was like wait a minute and remember she said of all the time you've known me right she makes this comment when she's talking about the money investment yeah and I was like, all the time she's known her. And I was like, I don't get that line. And so I went back and researched it. Come to find out, Charlene was the secretary of Julia's dead husband. Oh, wow. Okay. So I didn't, I had no idea, like, you know, because you're you're trying to figure out, like, why a show has a rapport that it has, right? Yep. And so I realized as I was re-watching this for, like, the 18th time, I was like, I was like, that doesn't, it doesn't make sense, right? They, mm-hmm. The way they interact with each other doesn't make sense. And so then I found that out. I was like, wait, that means that Julie and, and Charlene have actually known each other for years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because it was like Charlene gave, gave half of her savings to Julie and all, and like yep. all of those things I was confused about. Yep. But then when I read that, I was like, oh, so that makes so much more sense now why they have this almost sisterly bond uh, between them. Yeah, Charlene, Charlene, Charlene bleh, gave all of her, half of her savings to Julia. Mary Jo, you come find out, gave everything except for her, basically her children's college fund. Yep. To do this. Um, Which that gets into a whole nother ball game as this episode winds into things because. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we're not going to, we're not going to make a quantum leap to that part yet. <laughs> <laughs> The world's most boring character actor. Um, <laughs> we'll get we'll we, we'll get to that in a little. We'll bit. get to that enterprise in a little while. Um, <laughs> so um, then Julia walks over uh, and and finds a random lamp that somebody returned, and he doesn't like it because and these are just the little side jokes that always come up in this. He doesn't like it because it makes his nudes look too lewd. Right. <laughs> except except for the ones with wings because they're angels. Exactly. <laughs> and I think I think if I remember correctly, this person is a recurring like yeah. crazy house that they just keep on going through over yeah. and over and over and over again. He's basically their biggest customer. Yes. Like he's like he's a running gag through the whole series like He's always having them do something to his house. All also undercurrent because he wants to have sex with all of them. Like that's yeah. like really what it comes down to. Yep. But none of them do it. So, and then we 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 break to the oddest commercial break. Like, wh- who put this here? It was the nine eighties. It was the eighties, and it's the pilot. That's why it's right here. We have to put these commercials in. So go get your tab, and then. <laughs> Oh, we come back. Tab, <laughs> yes. Um, so we find out Charlene may have a boyfriend, and blah blah blah. Who cares? Because Delta Burke walks in. <laughs> Everything stops when Delta Burke walks in. So, dear listeners, we're dear gonna, listeners, <laughs> we're gonna pause here for a moment to just explain to you that for myself and um, the Divine Miss Mims here, in 1986, we thought Delta Burke was one of the greatest things that ever happened to television. Literally, we we were obsessed with Delta Burke almost almost as much as her contemporary and Jillian. Uh, <laughs> who was also very big at that time. Can we do a podcast about Up All Night, by the way? Just can we, please? I'd forgotten about that. Can we single-handedly 
bring back up all night and then also do a podcast about it's a living about the there were so many amazing all female cast shows in the early Girl, 80s we could, we could do a podcast of it's a living there's only 14 episodes <laughs> i want to so bad that'll be a side project that'll be we'll do that for like a holiday episode the the, the, the failed sitcom podcast let's do oh, it my goodness let's just... anyway anyway it would definitely sorry delta sorry Park. delta Park, focus, Park, delta focus. sorry focus. focus all those sunglasses so <laughs> Can I tell you, her outfit, I kind of want to like recreate it now for drag because the whole thing was just a magnificent little, it was like dynasty run through it Dixie was. land. Like she was perfect. Let, let's, let's, Delta Park plays Suzanne Sugarbaker, uh, Julia's younger sister, who a, 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 a very flirtatious woman, we'll call it. She has a bunch of ex-husbands. Bunch of ex-husbands. What was the joke? Uh, Charlene. Uh, I think you've misplaced all of my alimony checks. And Charlene says, "No, uh, no, Suzanne, they're right here in order, in alphabetical order." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like Delta Park herself, you'll you'll come later on to find out she's playing a former Miss Georgia. Mm-hmm. Delta Park herself was actually a Miss Florida, like she she's she's beautiful in that eighties way. She's got this bright black hair yeah i can't think of a way to say it more than bright black that's the best way to describe it (laughs) somehow it's both of those things yeah beautiful blue eyes like she is gorgeous and hilarious she's still hilarious no she is she was kind of like uh she was like a uh a a woolworth version of elizabeth taylor that that is the best way to put it so now that we've been introduced to the four main characters I have a bit of trivia for you. For me? Yeah, I've got a question. Okay. One of the four main characters that we have met is not from the South. Which one is it? Annie Potts. Wrong. What? She's from Tennessee. It is Jean Smart, who is from Washington State. No. She made, she came up through the theater scene in Washington. That is amazing. That makes so much sense now why she's had the longest, most successful career out of all of them. Yeah, she could drop a Southern accent. <laughs> yeah, that makes so much sense. But it's so funny because like, ah, uh, that's, well, you know what though? I should have, I should have like, not so quickly guessed because of course, Annie Potts, for anybody that's been under a rock for the last 30 plus years, Annie Potts, uh, played the amazing secretary in Ghostbusters, Janine, who her Janine. accent her <laughs> accent was so amazing that I was like, surely this has to be like that was the real accent and the designing women must be the fake accent. But now I'm like, oh, my whole worldview has been shifted. <laughs> wow. Oh goodness. So Delta Burke tells them that she's got a new client for them that'll make them all this money um be an interracial couple oh no racism you're getting ready to hit she says she (laughs) got it she got it by um mentioning her family's uh uh health and the civil rights struggle that's right (laughs) and i'll let you deliver the line (laughs) (laughs) Suzanne, Suzanne says uh, 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 that about the, her family, and, and uh, Julia says, "What help?" <laughs> and Suzanne said, "Oh, you remember when they were having that big meeting at the town, and Mother stood up and said, if the races must mingle, let it begin with me and Harry Belafonte.'" <laughs> bravo, bravo, Mrs. Sugar Baker, bravo. <laughs> Racism solved. Racism solved. <laughs> um, so then we find out that, um, and this this is actually moving on the plot. We've now got all the backstory for all the people. So now finally at like minute 12, we're at the plot of this episode. Yep, which centers on Suzanne's vagina. Correct. Uh, her uh, gynecologist is retiring for personal reasons. And uh, Julia has one of my favorite one-liners in the show. Let him go. He's paid his dues. <laughs> so Suzanne, Suzanne's like asking around, does anybody know a gynecologist? 
Conveniently. Mary Jo's ex-husband is a gynecologist. J.D. Shackelford. Is that his name? Yeah. Oh, God. Um, I, 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 I dislike... I just like the leap we're going to take it a little bit so much that I just ignored him. <laughs> wow. And I looked it up and he is actually plays her ex-husband throughout the all of it. Like, Wait, is it J.D. Shackover? I think I got the name wrong. It's no, his is Ted. Ted Shively. Ted Shively. Ted Shively. Ted Shively. That's right. <laughs> um, I didn't well, notate it either. I didn't know it did that. It's like I I I forgot. I forgot completely that that Scott Bakula was was on this show. Ruined it, but yeah, Scott Bakula is on the show. Oh God! So we immediately cut to black and then come back, and we find out that Suzanne's dating Ted now. <laughs> I wanted to ask you this question, right? Because this is the thing that was really weird to me, because. Uh-huh. On on the episode, it looks like it's all transpired over one day, because Suzanne's outfit hasn't changed. The, a lot of their episodes do just happen in one or two days. Yeah, so it was like yeah. she went there in her same outfit. Yeah, that was in the earlier part of the episode where right. she got his name and number, right. and by the end of the day, they're now a couple. Well, she's rich, so she can do whatever she wants. That's like th- there's 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 sort of a dichotomy going on in this. Suzanne has all of this money, and yes, from her ex husbands, right? And and she she keeps sugar bakers afloat. Like it's it's implied that that's why she's there because she she just hands money over to them. Yeah, like I didn't realize this either that she was considered like the silent partner, right? Like yeah. because there's always like they always have these jokes. It's like fifty fifty about why Suzanne doesn't do anything. But right. also, like, why is she here? Because right. she's a silent partner. And if you're going to be here, you should help out. And she's like, well, that's not why I'm here. I'm just going right. to hang out. Hi, Divine Miss Mims here. If you're enjoying this nonsense, you can follow us at Mims and Mame on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Also, to our Patreon supporters, thank you. We couldn't do this without you. So she starts dating Ted yep. and like come, Julia comes back with my favorite line in the episode. Is I've written the, it down. Is this the arch joke? No. Oh. Forgive my stupidity, but just how does one make that jump from stirrups in a doctor's office to a booth at DJI Friday? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I thought I thought because I I notated my favorite joke, which I thought uh-huh. was going to be yours, which was if sex were fast food, there'd be an arch over your bed. <laughs> so I was nope. like, TGI Fridays, TGI Fridays. <laughs> so then you, uh, Mary Jo Chively, <laughs> start pretending that everything's okay, and just keep pretending everything's okay. You're asked seventeen a hundred times. No, no, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. Well, why did Ted leave you? Oh, he was cheating on me, but it's okay. (laughs) You know, I have to say, at the ripe old age of 40 going on 41 years old, Uh I felt seen. (laughs) (laughs) I I felt so seen, and uh, I was not okay. I wasn't prepared. I was like, Oh, this is too close to home at this point. I am literally living this life. Well, and then, like, I, Mary Jo's discussion about her body parts and sex. Like, I could. Suzanne reads it like she's talking about sex. Yeah. I read it in watching it like she's talking about her naughty bits. She is. No, she definitely. Like this is actually a very well written, yes. Like like inner interpersonal thing that this woman is really going through yeah. about that, right? Like she and she does it in like her her like her dismissive dry humor, you know. But she talks about the nurses. She calls. She says that all of the nurses that Ted kept hiring had, I don't know, these life threatening breasts. Like uh-huh. she really talks about herself. And if you think about it, right at this point in time. 
this is kind of like that mid 80s where women were like revisiting taking control of everything yep. right and their bodies and cosmos started becoming a thing again and yep. women were starting to, and so it was for women that were on the more like demure or not necessarily mm-hmm. adventurous what did she say she made that she made a vibrator about uh a, 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 a she a just vibrator. Like, a, a, like an electrical hazard right so it was like it was really interesting because it, it, the show was was basically setting up this another dichotomy that is going to be like this like sexually liberated woman and this other woman who is like in the on the other part of that spectrum when, when she when she's talking about her poussoir you need to go back and look at julia and charlene's faces cuz they both look <laughs> completely aghast right completely aghast um but after all this, Mary Jo says, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. So Suzanne leaves to go to dinner with Ted, and jo- Mary Jo calls her a bitch. <laughs> that's the second bitch of the episode, too, which in yeah, 1986, third. as a third, I can't, oh, I missed one. Because uh, Suzanne ca- says the word bitchy, Julia says bitchy, then she just call, I, out, calls her a bitch. I miss Julia saying bitchy, probably because yeah. it didn't seem out of place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but, you know, another thing that was really uh, prominent in this episode is the fact that Mary Jo is not taking alimony from this guy. Right. We haven't gotten to that yet, because you know what? <laughs> we have to go to Tokyo Gardens and eat sushi in Atlanta in the 80s. <laughs> Which, which technically, a Tokyo restaurant in the 80s would have been very exotic. Oh, yeah, would have been. Especially yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. Like, yeah. That would have been, actually, that would have been considered very fancy. And it is showing that these women are modern, especially since they're all eating alone, like, just a group of women. <laughs> at, at a At a, at a like, Tokyo Gardens. Um, then Mary Jo... Mary Jo then says she's not taking alimony, even though she put him through med school, right? Med school, exactly. Um, and then, um, then we then we're gonna we're approaching our very first Julia Sugar Baker uh, official official rant. Right, right. A uh, uh, creepy Mister Roper comes over. No, don't do it. You have to do it justice. That is Ray Don Simpson. Simpson. <laughs> Ray Don, you have to say it with the, with the Ray Don Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> and Julia goes off on him like the rant comes, was too long to write down. Honestly, exactly. the rant was so long. He comes over with his Singapore sling. What that man is doing at a bar at a to- at Tokyo Gardens in like just sitting at the bar sees a group of women comes up with his singapore sling and decides to sit down with them because there's empty space you know fuck him excuse me yep <laughs> i can say that um i may believe it we'll see but yeah and so julia's like i'm here with my female friends i don't need a man to be here please leave what is it i she says it multiple Girl, times frozen she's... i'm not frozen are you oh, frozen? you were but now you're back you're, yeah. you're back what, what were you saying what were you saying I like, I think my favorite part about the rant is like every time she says, and I want to thank you, Ray Ray (laughs) Dawn. But, but here's something uh, uh, for audiences that are still getting used to this ecosystem, right? That may have not watched Designing Women. You can always tell a a proper Julie Sugar Baker rant because at the end of the rant, is always a uh, voluminous applause from the audience. Uh-huh. So you will only hear it, the audience will only clap that much during this post-rant moment, which right. gives gives the time to breathe because there's always a reaction post uh, post the, the rant of whoever she's doing the rant to. So right. that's that's you don't want to have that moment lost in the reaction to it. So they want you to experience the rant going over the person uh-huh. in the same way. In which case, Ray Don, strangely enough, says in this restaurant, I've got some phone calls I need to go make. Yeah, yeah. And then exit Ray Don. <laughs> still, still confused as to like, what does that even mean in the context of you're at a restaurant 
and you have to go make fo- obviously we know he doesn't have a cell phone because it's 1986 yeah but i was that was just such a strange exit line to me well you know who's coming back on the scene it's suzanne <laughs> it's sugarbaker Suzanne Maker's back and like the the chef knows her hey suzanne like and like she comes she sits down and ted has bought or no wait <laughs> Her and Ted are going to Paris. They're going to Paris now. Once just again, just for the weekend. Once just again, weekend. it's been a day. It's been a day. And Ted, Ted has bought her a ring. Yes. And they are no wait, wait. wait. no those are, he bought her a ring. They're going to Paris, and that's where they had the little exchange where uh, Mary Jo talks about all of the crappy things that he did for her, right. like buy her an opal ring. Right. And everybody is ganging up on Suzanne, to which she then says, "Well, if you're going to react to that, you're not going to like my other news." I, 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 I have, I have another little Julia, Julia one-liner I liked it there when she showed the ring. Well, that must have put him back a couple of hysterectomies. Yes. <laughs> uh... So they're engaged. <laughs> yeah, they're engaged. <laughs> Mind you, ladies and gentlemen, everything in between, and the audience, it's been. Not even 24 hours based on the based on the mathematics of the show. Now, this dinner itself could have been maybe a few days later, uh-huh. but they don't they don't really state that in any way. They don't state that any actual time has passed between the the first two acts happening in this. So we well, have no well, idea. It, well, it it had to be because right because she, Suzanne went to dinner with him. Okay. Why would she? Why would she be meeting them for? And this seemed like lunch, right? This seemed like lunch the next they day. Were, they were dressed in evening. Like Suzanne had on evening wear. She wasn't dressed like daytime wear. She had on evening wear. Maybe that. Maybe this is a late dinner. Maybe this is. Maybe these girls are real mod, and it's like a real late. I don't know. I mean, it just ex- like it just that explains like the it. Singapore slang. Yeah. That like. Mm. So yeah, I was like. That I, I had the same debate. I was like, ah, what is this time frame that we're looking at here? It, you know what the time frame is? 80s pilot. 80s pilots. <laughs> Speaking of pilots, oh Suzanne gosh. brings Scott Bakula in. <laughs> Not Scott Bakula. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Ladies and, and gentlemen of the audience and everything in between, Scott Bakula for 80s kids. Um, oh, God. He it was, was a quantum leap. He was quantum leap. TV's quantum leap. If you've not watched it, I don't not that sure to tell you at that point. It's like kind of like one of those things where it didn't age well um, at all. But so, so uh, I, I've I've never been the biggest Scott Bakula fan. I've always found him very boring. He's like a boring version of Mandy Patinkin. Wow. And like Mandy Patinkin doesn't do it for me very much either. Wow. Um. I'm not, a, I mean, I'm not also, I was never, like, I, I was not a diehard Quantum Leap person. If yeah. I, if I did like Quantum Leap, it was because of his, the other guy, um, like, yeah, the actual, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Hell, good character whatever. actor. Yeah. Um, like, I liked him a lot more, but yeah, but, but at the time, this was pre-Quantum Leap, so this oh, was yeah. like, this was like a before stardom Scott Bakula. And I, I would also like to say, um... Did I just lose what I would like to say? I think I just lost what I would like to say. So we can keep going. That sounds about right. So yeah. yeah so um, so as as with anything, uh, uh, you know, we want to set things up with a nice little bow on it. So right. we've talked about Ted a lot on this episode, That's multiple exactly multiple right. times. So you know, it would be kind of like I don't know a cock tease if we just did not bring and produce Scott. So. Here comes Dr. Ted Shively in with Suzanne. Shock all over Mary Jo Shively's face. Right, right. It's it's like if somebody came in with your ex-boyfriend, I, that is exactly the way I feel like you would respond. Like, yeah, like, you're, are, are you frozen or is that just your, no, it's just your Sorry, face. Sorry, <laughs> I just had a moment. <laughs> there are certain moments in time where I think I would probably have the same reaction um anxiety shooting through my body yeah and uh but you know suzanne being suzanne and not realizing that some people actually have um emotions <laughs> so oh i remember what i was gonna say two things i've got one previous and one now um 
I do like the fact that they chose a worse actor than the four women to play the, the ex-husband. Now, going back to what Suzanne's doing right here, I actually think Suzanne is trying to help. And I think she's kind of successful. Because what Suzanne does is bring him in, take everybody else out for them to sit there and have a coming to Jesus that Mary Jo was always too scared to have. I agree with that statement in part <laughs> because this is the other thing that we learn about this show is that nothing Suzanne Sugarbaker does is ever purely for the other person it's true right and so when you're when you're having that thought process of oh wait no it is no 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 it's not and and they actually confirm it by the end of the episode. So, right. so uh, JD and, and Mary Jo. Uh, Ted, 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 Ted. Who is JD? JD is eventually going to be with Charlene. That's right. That's why. Yeah, I think yeah, 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 yeah. That's, so, yeah. so Dr. Ted and Mary Jo, they hash it out, right? It's like a, it's like a couple's therapy. They flash forward. So it looks like it's been many hours that they've been right. sitting and there. It's dark outside. Right. Which is even stranger because you're like, what were they doing in the other room this entire time? I don't, um, I don't know. Looking for Meshach Taylor because that's his job. Yeah, that's true. So they, <laughs> they're ha they're hashing it out where they're they're you know they're doing all of these like little like uh, jokes, but they're not really jokes because they're kind of right. painful. Right. And uh, in which Mary Jo she just ends her thing and she's exhausted and he's exhausted and she just basically says, "I don't want your money." I don't right. want this. I don't want that. I just want a sign that it was all worth it, that it all meant something. And he uh, says, well, what is you. that? I just want to thank you. Right. And he can't do it. He can't do it. Which was he like, it, it made me hate Scott Bakula so much. I was like, oh. And then Mary Jo calls him a jackass. Yeah. That is four cussings in a show. In 1986. That is a lot that is a lot and i i like the i like the line because he does eventually say thank you and right it's actually it is actually really nice but i i, I <laughs> the line that i related to most in this episode came from mary joe obviously what she says it's amazing how mad you can get letting it build up for 10 to 12 years <laughs> <laughs> well you know and after he says thank you Immediately, Suzanne's like, "We've been stuck in this back room for way too long." <laughs> yeah, right, it was it was go. it was instant. It was literally instant. It was like it wasn't like they kind of drifted in. It was like literally they've been listening at the door the entire time. And as soon as he did what she wanted, they were like, "Great, you're done." It's like the director was like, "We only have five more minutes on this set. Let's get this wrapped up, people. Let's get yeah. this wrapped up." CBS is booking us by the hours. Because CBS actually like they were the they were the producing partners. I didn't know that about the show. That's probably like part of the reason why it's been difficult for it to get rebroadcast. Because CBS has actually been pretty stingy with their shows that they license back out for right. um, reruns. But um, but I will say the uh, the other great line that they had on here was uh, when Su uh, Suzanne when uh, Mary Jo called uh, she does her little cheers to everybody. Yeah, and she calls she says about Julia. She's the best of the big-shouldered broads. And I was like, uh -huh. Aww. It's true. And it ends with the cheers with just those three. I miss shoulder people. Well, girl, you can wear them. I actually think I'm going to start doing that. Like, just doing exaggerated shoulder pads in my dresses. You, if, if, are, are you wanting to do, like, pointy ones or just, like... No, now. everybody's doing those pointy things now. Like, I will, I want to do it just like some old school 80s, like, power shoulders. So, I would not actually put in a pad. I would just shape up a little because you have broad shoulders. Yeah. And just, like, do a shape because you've already got the padding. You just need the shape of it, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I'm actually into that. So, I think because that would be a new thing. If, 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 you, if, you do, if you do, the pads will actually look like muscle as opposed to... It looks like really, you're on the roids. I really want <laughs> so designing women has made me really want to transition and like have two different drag drag personas, right? So uh -huh. obviously my uh first one is based on the 1950s. I would love to start making some 80s wear like dynasty and designing women era things. So I had a coat that was stolen from me. Yeah. 
it basically it would basically look like the coat that uh um Suzanne was wearing in the episode. Okay. But it was in uh Whorehound. Ooh. And I I got that thing for Ross Cross Dress for Less, ten dollars. It was so warm. One night, one night after after doing a little bit of drag, I, I was too drunk to drive home. I got in the back of my car, cuddled up in that, and fell asleep for a few hours. It was 35 degrees outside. I didn't feel it. It was fantastic. Those I missed that amazing. coat. So so that is episode one of Baking Sugar, a Designing Women podcast. A Designing Women podcast. Um, and oh, um, I would like to give a special thank you to the designer of our logo. He is a great um, artiste. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you didn't write it down. Girl, I got Instagram. Mr. Mahaffey. You can find his link in our um, podcast. He does a lot of uh, stencil work, um, graffiti stencil work. I don't want to, I don't want you to think it's like he bought some acrylics and it's doing it on like some ceramic. No, no, no. It's um, I love his Princess Leia's. I love his. Um, he's got uh, Julia Sugarbaker. He's got several other items. Please go check him out. I'll probably you know edit this out and make something a little more formal in a little bit. But you know, right now it's a wandering miss mims i have to write my shit down in order to actually read it but i'll do a i'll do a very special thank you after this <laughs> yeah so go support go support him um we love we love all of these up and coming folks they help support the old queens that we are that is absolutely right well girl i will see you next time yes next week we're going to be doing uh, episode two. What's this episode Hold two on. Called? Episode two is called... I'll tell you in a second. It okay. is called... Episode two is called... Oh, le- let me pause for a second before we go. Okay. Episode two is basically the most famous of all of the Designing Women episodes. So much so that folks like myself, and I'm sure Miss Mims as well, thought that this happened well into the show and wasn't the second episode. The second episode is... The beauty contest. Oh, 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 we'll yeah. talk about that next time because yeah. we maybe should start talking about some of the controversies. I'll see if I can get like some people magazines and stuff back from back in the day because there were some issues with the cast oh, and yeah. the production company. I'll see what I can do. Yeah, but the second episode, when we start talking about it to all of you, you're going to be like, oh, that was the number two episode of the show? I thought that was well into it. No. Yeah, I, d- just, I did too. I yeah, did too. No, it is just the 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 one that, that like, I, I want to say that it is the one that confirmed the show's existence. The first one was good. The second one is the one that uh, basically the CBS probably was like, okay, I guess we got a season. <laughs> we, exactly. We're going to exactly. have to do a full season of this, so. So next week is the beauty contest. And uh, thank you for listening to Baking Sugar, a Designing Women podcast. We love you. I am Auntie Mame. And I am the Divine Miss Mims. Have yourself a sweet, sweet evening. Bye. Well, that was something. Bye. (laughs) Bye.